welcome. Hi, everyone. I'm Jan Kemp, the Assistant Dean at the Library, and I'd just like to welcome you to the Library's Spring Pizza and Research event. Um, today, we're really excited to have Dr. Brian Gervais talking about, as you can see, political incivility in the digital age. Before he gets started, I'd just like to ask a couple of favors. You'll probably see that we have evaluation forms on your sheet. If you could please fill those out, we would really appreciate the input. And also, if you could let us know uh, in the comment area how you found out about the event, um, that would help us invite people in the future. Um, and so, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Deanne Ivey, who's our coordinator for open education and our social sciences librarian. I'm really excited to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Gervais. So I'd like to give you guys a little bit of info about him before he starts. Um, Dr. Gervais has his PhD from the University of Maryland, and he is an assistant professor in the Department of Poli Sci and Geography, and he's also the coordinator of the Digital Pol Politics Studio at UTSA. Um, Dr. Gervais researches and teaches in the areas of political communication and political psychology. Um, and with a big particular focus on the effects of uncivil political discourse. Um, Gervais is the co-author with Erwin Ir Morris of Reactionary Republicanism, How the Tea Party in the House Paved the Way for Trump's Victory through Oxford University Press. His publications have appeared in the journals Political Psychology, um, Political Communication, Politics, Groups, and Identities, PS, Political Science and Politics, International Journal of Public Opinion Research, Social Science Quarterly, and Journal of Information Technology and Politics. And without further ado, I will go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Gervais. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Deanne. Uh, uh, thank you to uh, Dean Kemp for having me and to uh, all of the library staff. Um, and thanks to you all for taking some time out of your busy days to be here today. Um, so I'm going to be talking about political incivility in the digital age, as uh, you probably are already aware. And just a quick show of hands. Who's thought about political incivility over the last year or so? All right. So something on all of our minds is probably something that lots of us experience um, in our digital lives on a daily basis, a weekly basis. Um, and it's something that sometimes some of us are concerned about. Sometimes we think maybe there's not a problem with it, right? Maybe more of the issue is with people censoring themselves, right? Maybe the issue is political correctness and societal obsession with political correctness. I want to talk about those ideas today, all right? So the first thing I'm going to talk about is try to define political incivility, right? It's a tough thing to define. It's a very subjective concept. It's a very context-dependent concept, right? I'm going to explain that a little bit. Then I'm going to talk about what we might think its effects are. That is, when we're exposed to political incivility, what effect does it have on us as individuals? What effects does it have on groups? Right. I'm going to actually present or I'll talk a little bit about some findings from some research I've done on political incivility. And then I hope to cut it off early because I really want to hear from you guys too. And I want to have some time for a little bit of questions towards the end. So if I'm running low on time, someone cut me off, okay? I, it won't be considered uncivil. All right, so what is political incivility? Well, I mentioned earlier, it's context dependent. Right? And what that means is that it doesn't stay constant over time. It doesn't stay constant across places. Right? What's uncivil in the United States in 2019 isn't necessarily what was considered uncivil in Russia in 1857. And that's a very random year in a random country, but that's the point. In fact, what's considered uncivil in the United States today, right, in 2019, is not necessarily the same thing that was considered uncivil 10 years ago. Here's an example. When Barack Obama became president of the United States and he rolled out his Affordable Care Act, right, known as Obamacare, there's plenty of signs that went up everywhere showing him looking like the Joker from The Dark Knight, Right, Heath Ledger, and there was an epithet under that socialist. Right? He was bringing about socialism. Many on the left, many liberals, many Democrats decried this as uncivil, calling Barack Obama a socialist. 
is hyperbolic, misrepresentative of his actual positions. Then 2016 comes along, and we had a surprising candidacy of Bernie Sanders, right? Going toe to toe with Hillary Clinton to an extent for the 2016 Democratic national nomination for president. And Sanders identified himself as a Democratic socialist. And now we've got a new slew of Democrats in the House of Representatives, including AOC, right, who call themselves Democratic Socialists. They've adopted the term, right? So what was once called uncivil, right, the term socialist, has been embraced by others. It's still not clear, right? If you call someone a socialist, is it uncivil or is it not? Right? So it's very subjective, and it very much depends on context and time. That said, there are some common types of uncivil discourse. And I define incivility, or at least political incivility, as this. Rhetoric or discursive behavior, right? The way we act when we're talking politics, right? Uh, that's meant to demonstrate a lack of respect, and I bolden that because that's the key element right? for opposing political groups or viewpoints. Right? So we're being uncivil, politically uncivil, when we're taking actions right, in the course of talking politics that are meant to generate disrespect or demonstrate disrespect for those we're opposed to. Importantly, right. Obviously, this has to occur in a political context, right? So it's not just being rude to people, failing to hold a door open for someone. That's not politically uncivil, right? If you fail to hold a door open for a Republican and you're a Democrat, then it might be politically uncivil. So what is politically, uh, what is political incivility not, right? One thing is not necessarily normatively wrong. Right? Normative is kind of a fancy phrase for meaning uh, something that's ethically correct, morally correct. Politically, being politically uncivil isn't necessarily normatively wrong. Right? Sometimes we think it is. Right? We talk about political incivility as being a bad in and of itself. That's not necessarily true. Political incivility can have positive effects for a democracy. It can mobilize people. A barn bar burning, rousing speech by a candidate can mobilize others to action, get them to turn out. Right? Certainly, we want people to vote. We want people to take political action. That's important for a well functioning democracy. All right. At the same time, sometimes, right, being politically un uncivil or doing something that's politically uncivil is right or the correct thing to do in the sense that it's not inaccurate. Sometimes we call a liar a liar because. People are lying. Sometimes we call a racist a racist because they are a racist or they did racist things. Now we might say liar, racist. These are uncivil terms, right? But sometimes they should be used, right? Or it's correct to use them. Also, incivility is not the same thing as honesty, right? Sometimes we conflate the two ideas. We say when people are being politically uncivil, they're just telling it like it is. Being brutally honest. Not afraid to speak the truth. That's not necessarily true, especially when we're talking about political elites. Right? To the extent that political incivility does mobilize, it does get people to pay attention. It does draw attention to a political elite. It mobilizes their supporters to become active. Right? To the extent that these things happen, right, then a political elite uh, certainly is motivated to be uncivil, say uncivil things, even if that's not necessarily what they actually believe. Right? And think about political uncivility online. On social media, we post things. Political elites post things. Everyone posts things right? in hopes of getting some attention, getting likes, getting shares, Right? Uh, getting thumbs up, right? Um, getting retweeted, whatever. Right? That's the currency of social media to an extent. Now, what gets people paying attention to what you're saying? How do you stand out among millions of other voices? Because I have billions at this point of other voices online. Well, 
Being uncivil is one way of doing that, as I'm going to talk about. And so incivility is incentivized, at least in online environments. And in some respects, commodified as well. Right? People doing incendiary YouTube videos can make money off of doing that stuff through conspiracy theories. Right? On the other hand, civil discourse is not the same as political correctness. Right? And the main distinction I'm going to uh, say here is political correctness is about doing efforts to not offend others, right? Uh, not to offend other people in any sort of way, trying to be inclusive, right? Being politically civil, that is talking about politics without incorporating incivility to your discourse, right, uh, doesn't mean you're not being negative. It doesn't mean you're not being critical of people's ideas, right, of political positions, right? You're just not talking about the individual, right? You're not just not denigrating a person, demonstrating disrespect for that individual. So what does political incivility actually look like online? Well, here's the fun part. Right? Let's break down some tweets. Now, I'm going to show you some tweets from President Donald Trump. Right? And the reason why we do this is because, well, he's probably the most famous tweeter in the world, right? probably the person most often associated with Twitter. But the other thing is that he's exceptionally good at incorporating incivility into his tweets. Various types of uncivil elements he jammed packs Right, in 140 characters or less, or 280 characters now. Right? Better, or to a greater extent, than many other political elites can. Right? So here's one for you right here. Despite spending $500,000 a day on TV ads alone, hashtag crooked Hillary falls flat in nationwide Quinnipiac poll, having zero impact, sad. Right? This is a pretty typical tweet from Trump, at least during the 2016 presidential campaign. We have a few different types of uncivil elements here. One thing, all right, one category of incivility I often look for is what I call insults and ridicule. All right? The crooked Hillary epithet here, right? Perfect example of that. All right? Trump's very good at using uh, epithets like, you know, lying Ted, crooked Hillary, little Marco, all that sort of stuff. All right? There's something else here. There's some hyperbole, some distortion, some misrepresentation of political viewpoints and positions, right? Saying that she fall, fall, fell flat in a nationwide poll, that's eh, a little hyperbolic there. It's a little bit off, right? And also saying zero impact, it's a little hyperbolic as well. Not the perfect example of this type of incivility, right? But I would say it probably uh, qualifies. Now, my favorite part, my favorite type of political incivility is what I call digital stridency, right? And this is the actual uh, uh, visual elements. Right? And there's visual elements of online political incivility as well. Right? And that's the strategic use of caps, capitalization, right? and multiple exclamation points there. Right? Zero impact, the multiple exclamation points after sad. Right? This actually is a very powerful type of political incivility, a drawing attention right? and generating emotional responses in people who are, who are used to it. We'd say it's a text-based equivalent of shouting. Right? You say you can't shout online? You can. Right? We all know the person who types in all caps and they're like, why are you doing this? Why are you shouting? Right? Um, and people do this online just as they do it in person. All right. Here's another example. Little Marco Rubio gave amnesty to criminal aliens guilty of sex offenses disgrace. Right? Again, we have the epithet, right? the insults, the mockery. Little Marco Rubio. Right? We have... Uh, the hyperbole distortion, this time misrepresenting what Rubio actually did, right? Uh, exaggerating it, spinning it, right? Giving amnesty to criminal aliens guilty of sex offenses. Not actually true, right? And then disgrace, all in caps locks, right? The digital equivalent of shouting there, the digital stridency. Mm -hmm. Now, these are a few elements of incivility, the type of incivility we see online. There's other types too. Right? One is threats. Right? Lying Ted Cruz just used a picture of Melania from a GQ uh, shoot in his ad. Be careful, Lying Ted, or I'll spill the beans on your wife. Right? Threats, right? just like threats uh, in interpersonal discourse, face-to-face -face discussion, right? online, right? in a political context, that's political incivility as well. 
and conspiracy theories. This is the toughest to identify. But generally, we'd say conspiracy theories are, are accusations of very sinister, dishonest, bad type of behavior. And there seems to be no basis for it, right? There doesn't seem to be exaggerated behavior or anything. There doesn't seem to be any truth to it, right? So for example, an extremely credible source has called my office and told me that Barack Obama's birth certificate is a fraud, right? This is what we call the birther conspiracy theory that Donald Trump spread. 2012, 2013, well before he ran for president, while Barack Obama was still president. Uh, certainly, Barack Obama, as we know, released his real birth certificate in response to this, right? But there's never really any credible evidence, right, that Barack Obama wasn't born in Hawaii or wasn't born in the United States. So this is how political instability manifests itself online, right? Some of the ways. Now, what are the effects of being exposed to political instability of this sort? What are the effects of being exposed to an uncivil tweet? Well, this is actually a two-part question. Question one, how do we react when it's us, our in-groups, the groups we perceive ourselves as being a part of that are targeted by the incivility? If we are Democrats, when Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton is attacked right, in an uncivil way, how do we react? Right? And when it's, the second part of the question is, how do we react when it's the other side that is being targeted? When we believe the other side to be bad, right, or don't identify with them, and they are being accused of being, doing bad things, right, or being shouted at in an uncivil fashion online, or being called Little Marco or something like that, how do we react then? Well, we have some theory that uh, informs our expectations here. All right. When it's we who are being attacked, when it's our in-groups, right, um, when it's our party being attacked, we're probably going to act, react in an angry manner, a defensive manner. Right? So we know that party identification is a part of people's social identities. Social identity is essentially the groups you perceive yourself as being a part of. You might perceive yourself as being a woman, a Hispanic, a Caucasian, a male, a Catholic, a Jew, a Protestant, a Democrat, a liberal, a conservative, a Republican. Right? These are groups. And when our groups are targeted, we take it personally. We are motivated to protect the in-group, to protect our groups. It's how we protect our own self-esteem. So when our parties, our people, members of our groups, are attacked in uncivil ways, right, we get upset. So elite-based attacks, right, it's a political elite like Trump, attacking our in-group, this induces defensive anger. Efforts to try to protect the in-group. Now what about when it's the other side? Here's where it gets a little tricky. Some research suggests, well, when like-minded elites, as people who are part of our in-groups, attack the other side in an uncivil fashion, that also might motivate anger, generate anger. Think about it. We think that when people tune in to opinionated partisan media, right? If you are a conservative or a Republican tuning into Rush Limbaugh, or Sean Hannity and Fox News, right? Or a Democrat liberal tuning into the Huffington Post, right? Or MSNBC, and we hear the other side being bashed, right? We hear the other side, we hear about all the bad things they are up to. We get upset, we get angry. We get our pitchforks, right? And go looking for them, right? This generates an angry mob mentality. That's the expectation, at least. Right? That like-minded right, uh, media, news media, opinion aid media, also motivates angry behavior aimed at the outgroup. Right. It also sends a message that discriminating against the outgroup is called for, necessary, appropriate. Right? It lowers our esteem for the outgroup. Right. These are some of the theoretical expectations. Right. Let's see how it actually bears out. I've conducted some experiments, right? 
And in a typical uh, experiment, um, sometimes I'm exposing people to tweets, fake tweets, so, right? And what I'm manipulating is the direction of the tweet. Is it coming from a Democrat or a Republican, right? And the presence of incivility. So take this tweet. This, uh, this is a fake tweet, one that I invented. It appears to be coming from CNN, right? And this tweet is what we call a control tweet. It's the control group here, right? CNN, when I did this experiment, it was early 2015. CNN was considered more of a neutral uh, uh, outlet at the time, right? Since then, it's fake news and all blah, 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 blah. It's become much more partisan. At the time, though, views of CNN were a little bit different, all right? So the tweet here, right, seems very innocuous, very straightforward, and that's the point, right? Let's talk about transportation, which isn't a very controversial subject, and that's the point as well. Right? So the tweet reads, several new national transportation plans are being considered. Tune in to learn what policy experts say is good and bad about each. Now, some people might have been randomly assigned to see this neutral tweet that's not supposed to really induce any sort of effect at all. Others, however, saw partisan tinge tweets, meaning they had a more partisan direction to them, but they're still civil. So some people saw this one apparently coming from Chris Matthews, who hosts a show on MSNBC and can sometimes be uncivil. And Matthews said, a new national transportation plan is being considered by Republicans. Ah, so now we're talking about a plan by Republicans. Tune in to learn why policy experts say it will not work. So there's a negative aspect to this now. We're being negative, we're being critical, still pretty civil though. Others were assigned to see this tweet. Same thing as the Matthews one, except it's said to be coming from Bill O'Reilly, who at the time still had a show on Fox News Channel, right? No longer is the case. Again, this is early 2015, right? And it's exactly the same as the Matthews tweet, except it comes from O'Reilly, and it's talking about Democrats rather than Republicans. Others saw uncivil versions of these two partisan tinged tweets, right? So here's the real fun part, is trying to take these tweets and trying to make them uncivil. Add in some of the elements I was talking about earlier, right? So the Chris Matthews version, <laughs> alert, in all caps locks, multiple exclamation points. A dangerous new transportation plan is being imposed by radical Democrats. Tune in to learn why even experts are scared, right? O'Reilly version is the same, same thing, except says Democrats rather than Republicans, right? Now, at the time, I got some flack for these tweets, right? People thought it's too over the top. No political elite would actually ever tweet like this in all cap locks with multiple exclamation points, right? This was early 2015. If it, a little time had gone by and they saw Donald Trump starting to pick up in the polls in late 2015 in the fall into 2016, I think I would have got different responses, right? Anyway, so what happens, right? Again, people are randomly ex assigned to one of these tweets. So what happens when people are exposed to a uncivil tweet aimed at their in-group? So if they're a Democrat, right, it's the one by Bill O'Reilly. If they are a Republican, it's the one by Chris Matthews. Well, as we expect, theoretically, when it's our in-group that's being targeted by the incivility, we get angry. We get defensive. Those exposed to an uncivil tweet attacking their in-group, those who identify as Democrats or Republicans, had much higher levels of anger afterwards, right, than those who saw civil versions or the neutral tweet, right? And this led to other types of behavior, right? Those who felt angry afterwards were also more likely to be more resolutely partisan. By that, I mean they're more anti-deliberative. They held their ground. They're less open to compromise. They're less open to deliberation. They're less open to bipartisanship afterwards, right? And they offered more partisan comments, and they were more likely to voluntarily blame the other side, right, for problems in the country, right? So I had to ask an open-ended question afterwards, what do you think is the most important problem in the country today? Those who had been angered by the uncivil tweet that they saw were more likely to identify the other side as the most important problem in the country today, right? Or more likely to name a problem, like, say, immigration, and say, and it's caused by those darn Democrats, or those darn Republicans. Mm -hmm. They're also more likely to use incivility in their own comments, right? So we get offended, we get angry, right? We get defensive, and we're likely to return the favor, be uncivil, and say uncivil things about the other side afterwards. Now, what about when the other side's the target? When we're exposed to incivility 
or uncivil discourse attacking the other side. How do we react then? Well, here's where it gets funny. Like-minded uncivil messages, and I've tried this in a few different experiments now, right, have little consistent impact on those exposed to them, meaning there really doesn't seem to be much of a pattern at all. I've tried my best to get people angry and upset by saying bad things about the other side, right? And we don't really necessarily get upset, or at least not consistently so. It does not, as theory suggests, seem to generate anger and disdain towards the outgroup, at least writ large. Right? And this finding, these findings and these experiments are actually consistent with a lot of other research, right? including one important study that came out recently that found tuning in to MSNBC or Fox News when it's your group, right? When you're a liberal watching MSNBC or uh, you're a conservative watching Fox News actually might lead you to have improved feelings towards the other side afterwards. What? That seems crazy, doesn't it? So there's something odd and interesting going on here. All right. Here's what I think it is. All right. Why don't partisans become more incensed, more angry when they're exposed to like-minded incivility, when they hear about all the bad things the other side is up to and doing? Why aren't they getting angry and grabbing their pitchforks? Well, we really need to separate out people. Right? I think reactions to like-minded incivility are multifarious. And what I mean by that is some people become angry. Some people don't. Some people get uncomfortable with the incivility, even when it's the other side that's being attacked. And there's a whole bunch of different factors right, that might affect whether or not someone gets angry when the other side's attacked at the other side. Right, or feels uncomfortable with it, or feels anxious about it, or has no effect on them at all. Right. And the big point is that, whereas incivility attacking our outgroup seems to have a consistent effect on people, no matter what, right? no matter how interested we are in politics, right? uh, no matter how strongly we identify the group, we seem to get offended when our group's attacked. It seems to be a very, very different case with like-minded incivility. All right. It depends on the individual. People, in particular, who are conflict adverse, uncomfortable with conflict, right, seem to be uh, the least likely to be offended or angered by incivility attacking the other side. Right? They seem to get anxious and uncomfortable about it. There's still a lot more to explore here, though. Right? These are early findings into the effects of like-minded incivility. So what are the next steps? Well, one is we need to explore this differential reactions to like-minded incivility more. We need to play around with like-minded incivility more, expose people to more fake tweets, and try to really see what personal characteristics lead to people becoming angry about the other side uh, and what sorts of people are not right, really angered by like-minded incivility. Another thing and another uh, area of research uh, that this larger project on incivility I've been working on is going and is also looking at the effects of gender. Right? Our expectations, and I'm working on this project with several colleagues, is that candidate gender has a huge effect. Right? Uh, namely, we think that people are less accepting of uncivil discourse, of uncivil tweets, for example, right, when the candidate is gender, or gender, is female. Right? Uh, whereas male candidates can get away with a little bit more, they're less likely to face backlash when they're uncivil than male candidates. And we've got some early findings to suggest this is the case, and we're going to explore this a little bit more. Okay? Now I'm going to turn it over for some questions in a minute, and, um, but um, one thing I just want to point out, uh, if you are interested in this sort of research, uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to promote um, our department here uh, and, and our master's program in particular, if you want to continue or you want interested in doing research like this in particular, we offer something called the Digital Politics Fellowship uh, that supports graduate students doing work on these questions and others. If you're interested in that, please feel free to contact me, right? Or if you're interested in our Political Science MA program, if you're interested in these sort of topics, you can contact me or Andrea Aleman. We're also going to be launching a new uh, Global Affairs uh, master's uh, program uh, soon as well. Um, and so 
exploring, if this is the sort of research or you're interested in these sort of things and something you want to do uh, for a life's work or whatever, right, uh, there's opportunities to continue your research after you're done uh, with your undergraduate degree right here at UTSA. Also, if you're interested in supporting the fellowship in some way, you can contact me um, and I can tell you more details about that, okay? So that wraps up me. I think I've talked a lot. I really want to hear from you some comments and thoughts. Um, and so I will turn it over. Thank you very much for your patience and for listening and being here. So all the examples were from Twitter. And I know you're trying to simplify your work. But yeah. Twitter is a particularly short form medium. Yeah. So there's, there's really no room for nuance. Um, yeah. It's going to be much more inclined, frankly, towards snark. Yep. Um, I mean, do these observations carry over rather well to longer form internet mediums? Yeah, right. And so, you know, at least in, in my research, I've exposed people to other things like press releases, right? Like a press release, you might see a, a candidate or an office holder send out through an email or something like that, which are a little bit longer than 140 characters and stuff like that. Um, and you have the same, uh, same sort of effects generally, right? When it's uh, aimed at the in-group, it generates anger, you get upset about it. Um, and when it's uh, uh, aimed at the out-group, it's less clear. I've also exposed people, um, and this is a little bit more complicated to explain, but one time I did an experiment where people thought they were engaging in some sort of chat room or online talk, right, in a comment section, right? In reality, all the comments that are being posted other than the peoples themselves were fake comments, right, that were going in there. So you had a long sort of conversation going on, right, and controlling how much incivility was in there and whether or not they saw uncivil comments or not, and the same sort of reactions as well, right? So in other types of experiments, not just tweets, right, we see the same sort of reactions. Now, if it was in a long newspaper article or something like that, I think that's an interesting question. Some of these types of incivility um, that I've been describing really don't, aren't things you would necessarily find in an opinion column. Um, you know, sort of, you know, you wouldn't see capitalized text and multiple exclamation points or something like that in a New York Times op-ed or something like that. Um, so that, that, that's an important point and an important caveat. Uh, but generally, I think that uh, these findings do apply to other types of discourse online. How did you choose your subjects for the experiment? <laughs> well, it, 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 it depended by, uh, um, depends on experiment. Um, for the experiment with the tweets I showed there, I went through, it's actually uh, called a brokerage. Um, and is anyone familiar with Qualtrics? All right, so if you know Qualtrics, right, Qualtrics is a platform where you design surveys and stuff like that. Well, Qualtrics also ser serves as a brokerage for getting subjects for online panels. And so I went through Qualtrics and I had particular um, uh, ideas of what sort of subjects I wanted or I wanted the demographics to look like the United States more broadly. And so I essentially purchased a, a, a sample through Qualtrics, right? And what they do is they're a broker, so they find other companies that can put together online samples for online experiments like this. Right, for other ones, sometimes I've used convenient samples, so I've recruited students unwittingly for experiments after IRB approval, right, and, and they were debriefed, don't worry, no one was upset, right? Uh, and, and other times, um, I've done it through, um, you know, existing big surveys, uh, online survey groups and things like that. That's a good question, though. How can we, is there a way that we can use this research to uh, reduce or affect the frequency of political instability that we see in online discourse, or is this more an exploration <coughs> of the effects of it? Good question. I think um, my research is much more focused on the effects, but there are other people studying political instability that are focused on ways of reducing it, right? Um, and some of it has to do with what I might we might call infrastructure, right? So what actual platforms and um, in, in sort of newspapers that have online comment sections, things that they can do, right, to try to lead people to be more civil online. And one neat thing uh, that I encourage you to all look at is research that's being done up the road at Austin um, by Talia Stroud um, and her colleagues, Stroud, S-T-R-O, 
OUD, and they have something called the Engaging News Project. And one thing they've looked into is alternatives to the like button that might lead people to be more civil. And one thing they have is a respect button, right? <laughs> and so they find, right, when people have the option of giving respect rather than just liking or something like that, people are more likely to be civil, less likely to be uncivil because they're looking for respect. And people are more likely to say, I respect you, right, when they approve or think the discourse is more civil and, and, and overall is better. And there's other uh, research, um, some by a, a researcher named Kevin Munger that looks at how bots can be used to lead people to be more civil online, right? People, you know, sort of bots sort of, I'm not sure if we're comfortable as bots policing our language, right? But there's some ways we can sort of have automated intelligence almost encourage us to be civil or encourage us to be less uncivil as well. Uh, do you feel that social media gave rise to the current political incivility or it preceded it at the federal level as far as the House and th groups like the Tea Party or Occupy Wall Street and all that? It, it's a really tough question. Um, I think in general trying to track incivility over time is something that's really difficult and I've tried to do it and it's not an easy thing to do. Partially again going back to the fact that incivility is context dependent and changes rapidly, right? What we think is uncivil one day can change over decades pretty quickly, right? And so tracing how uncivil people were in the past compared to today, you know, we have to kind of define incivility at that moment in time, which is a tough thing to do. Um, so tracing over time is a tough thing. That said, what I think uh, social media has done is just changed the way we are exposed to political incivility. Not saying that we're, people today are more uncivil than people were in the past, but we're more likely to encounter it on a day-to-day -day basis than we were in the past. Right? And uh, we are more likely to use incivility when we're talking politics online than we are in face to face discussions. So, as more, as, our as more of our political discussion becomes digital, the more time we spend online talking politics rather than face to face, more likely we are to use incivility, right? And at the same time, we're more likely to see it, right, in our day to day, -to -day lives as well when we log on, we see somebody, people we don't even know right? Trending for some reason, saying uncivil things. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, what effect is the political echo chambers that people find themselves in nowadays? In other words, like as someone on Facebook likes conservative yeah. viewpoints, they'll yeah. get more conservative viewpoints and vice versa. Same with YouTube. That's a great question. And that's the complicated thing, right? So that's what I was talking about with like-minded incivility, right? We, we think that being exposed to constant bashing of the other side, right? Being exposed to viewpoints that align with our own would lead to more disdain towards the outgroup, right? The other side. Um, but when we expose people to at least comments, right? That align with their in-group, when we expose people, if they're, you know, like uh, Bill O'Reilly, right? Or they're aligned with Bill O'Reilly, they're conservatives. When we expose them to tweets of O'Reilly being uncivil, they don't, aren't necessarily more angry towards Democrats afterwards than people who never saw that at, at all. So partially, this is a tough question, right? Because we can't really tra uh, trace the impact that uh, being exposed to Bill O'Reilly for an extended period over time has over people, right? So maybe if you watched O'Reilly or you watched Hannity for a period of five to 10 years, right? Your disdain towards the outgroup towards Democrats would be much higher than otherwise. And we're not gonna really capture that by exposing people to tweets in a single moment in time. So that's the tough part, right? But generally, I think it's an open question whether or not like-minded incivility, um, at least uh, online or even in, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, the conservative echo chamber or the liberal echo chamber to the extent that one exists, generates the same to, uh, to, towards the other side is an unanswered question. Um, partially because um, the evidence that we actually all really live in echo chambers, right, consistently so, uh, is an open question. There's a lot of research that suggests people are actually exposed to more viewpoints from the other side um, than, um, than folks commonly believe, right? Echo chamber, some, something of a myth. Is there any evidence that there's a difference in reaction between the different types of incivility? Like you started off with little Marco Rubio and, yeah, yeah. and the ad hominem things that talk about people's appearance. Yeah. Because I think that, that some of us might have a more visceral response to that than the ones that are more idea based or, you know, I don't agree with your politics, et cetera. 
Can you tell if there's a... I, I think that that's a great question. Um, and I think it makes a lot of sense to break out the various parts of incivility, right, and, and study uh, the different types and see what sort of effects they have on people. Some folks have done that to an extent, right? And um, other folks have found in other research, right, well, there seems to be consistent... Um, uh, or people at least consistently identify these types as uncivil. So they recognize them as being uncivil. That's a little bit different from saying that they have equally visceral reactions to all these types. The one thing that I have tested and looked at is whether or not the digital stridency, so the all caps locks and the multiple exclamation points, whether or not that seems to be more incendiary than the other types. And I found that to be the case, right? So when in one experiment, at least, when I removed like the caps lock and the multiple exclamation points, people were less likely to get angry afterwards. And breaking down exactly what's happening there is tough, right? Is it that seeing people do the digital shouting actually got people more angry and they saw this as you know, more disrespectful? Or were they more likely to pay attention to it, right? Because that's what it does. It draws in attention. The caps lock, the multiple exclamation points, you're more likely to focus on it. Untangling those things is a tough thing that we have, haven't quite done yet, but I think you know, that those are really good questions and things worth pursuing. Uh, quick question. Um, I don't know if you've done any research, but have you noticed any ties to people who don't particularly identify as Democrat or Republican, either party that's either making the incendiary yeah. comments or receiving them? Yeah. Do they get repulsed from the sort of conversation in general? Do you know if that's... You know, there doesn't seem to be a consistent um, uh, reaction among so-called independents. And part of that reason is because there isn't really, you know, a pure independent group is a collection of a whole bunch of type of people, right? There isn't sort of uh, a particular type of views that pure independents hold. And so we wouldn't expect there to be a consistent reaction among independents to, to incivility. Now that's uh, part of the answer. The other answer is that actually the vast majority of Americans don't qualify as independents, right? Even though we hear stories about the fact that um, the number of Americans who don't identify with a party is increasing, that the number of independents is growing, well, that's actually not completely true. What's increasing is people saying that they're independents, but then in follow-up questions, they identify as leaning towards one of the two parties. And people who lean, who say they're independents, but lean towards one of the parties, are very, very similar to what we call weak partisans, meaning we might ask people, do you strongly identify as a Democrat or weakly identify as a Democrat? Those who say they weakly identify as a Democrat have react the same, the same sort of behavior, same sort of views as people who say they're independents but lean towards the Democrats. And so after we take it into account to these people and say, well, they're technically Democrats, even though they say they're independents, they are leaning towards one of the parties, so they have some group attachment. So once we categorize them as Democrats and just focus on that sm small little fraction of people say, I don't even lean towards one of the parties, then we don't really see any consistent reaction among independents. Um, so the effects that we see from the uh, tweet that attack our in-group, uh, so anger um, and defensive responses, do those have any translation into the real world in our actions that we see? Um, or is that purely more of a, an online response? I, I think so, right? I think uh, when we, on a continual basis, right, um, are, are consistently exposed to attacks on our own group, then we're in sort of a constant state of defensive anger, angry at the other side, shaking our heads at the other side, right? That's certainly gonna have implications for compromise, right, at the elite level, right? If people who are part of the base don't want to see their members of Congress compromise, don't want to see them be more deliberative to make friends across the aisle, are resistant to that because they're angry and see the other side as, you know, bad people or illegitimate to an extent, but would rather see the other side attacked and defeated than absolutely, right? And, you know, we right now we are, let's see, very, very close to perhaps having a second government shutdown, right? Uh, we've had a fail of compromise, a fail of agreement and bipartisanship uh, among uh, members of Congress once again. And we have to think that the rhetoric that's out there might have something to do with this, right? That people really are angry and think this is high stakes and angry at the other side, right? And don't want to capitulate to the other side here, right? And I think that's consistent with some of the 
feelings that I've identified when people are exposed to, to incivility, right? When people are angry at the other side, angry at the out group, right, they're not going to want to compromise or find bipartisan solutions. So we've been talking about the United States politics. Have a lot of these trends carried over to foreign nations that are, have internets? Yeah, you know, there's been a couple of neat studies looking at um, uh, things concerning the EU, and, and not just Brexit, right, but also the EU more generally um, and how people, uh, how uncivil debates about countries' future in the EU um, have affected those countries' politics and, you know, uncivil discourse online in general. Um, the reason I'm not going to talk too much about those findings is that some of these studies, their definitions of incivility differ a lot from my own, all right, and I think Part of that issue just has to do, again, with context, right? Um, what is necessarily considered uncivil, right, in the United States uh, isn't necessarily the same thing as considered uncivil in, you know, Bulgaria, right, or, or Germany or France or the U.K. or something like that, right? The U.K. is probably a little bit closer, but it's going to be different a little bit, right? Now, in general, though, I think my definition of incivility, right, I think of saying uh, or, or communicating disrespect to the other side, I think that's probably pretty universal, right, when people feel that their in-groups are, are being attacked and their in-groups under attack, they are going to um, probably be defensive and feel angry just because that's a universal principle of social identity, right, and group, ide and, 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 and group identities. When our groups are attacked, we get defensive, we feel anger, although I haven't specifically looked at how incivility generates these reactions outside the United States? That's a good question. I had a question. Sure. I was wondering about, um, like I'll give an example of this. Uh, when Ted Cruz and Beto were going um, for each, uh, each other for the Senate, and there was an incident where a bunch of Beto supporters attacked and mocked um, Cruz and his wife yeah. at a restaurant and yeah. Beto immediately went on and said that is not okay you can't do that yeah and I was thinking about other times when um, Michelle Obama her thing of when they go low we go hot yeah have there been examples of um, political people who have tried to stop that and is there anything that has indicated that that's particularly helpful or it's not, you know, it's, it sounds nice and it's kind of an yeah. auto branch and it doesn't do much else. Oh, I, I think it could certainly help, right? I think there's certainly going to be some supporters uh, that would hear that message and say understood and, and would be less likely to, to act like that. I do think we absolutely follow elites um, and, and their example, when, especially when it comes to discursive behavior and other types of political engagement, right? It's sort of a... a you know, not so much of a big secret, right, but the elites really set the trends here, right? A lot of our uh, uh, opinions, political opinions, a lot of our, uh, the tone of our rhetoric, right, is stuff uh, from, that's it, really set, or that tone is set at the elite level. And so, well, I think when political elites can step in and say, mm, yeah, that's not acceptable, let's not do this, um, that that can probably have a, a, a positive effect, right? As long as they are leading by example, right, and being, being civil in their, in their own discourse, to the extent that we think this is a problem. I would say probably the most infamous example of this occurring was in the 2008 uh, presidential campaign trail when John McCain um, uh, who at that time was the Republican nominee uh, for uh, president. Uh, a few times uh, there was sort of a mic being passed around at his campaign rallies um, and people said some incendiary things about Barack Obama and, and John McCain would take the microphone and sort of correct them. And when, and when Senator McCain recently passed, there was one moment that was getting played on the news a lot of when um, you know, a, a woman was accusing him of you know, basically, well, there's a whole lot of things tied in here, right? But saying, well, he's a Muslim, he hates America, blah, 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 right? And not that these are, you know, of course, not identifying a Muslim is a bad thing at all, of course, right? But McCain took the microphone and was just like, no, not this. He doesn't hate America and all this. He's a good family man. So that's probably the most infamous example, I think, of somebody, um, uh, you know, sort of stopping supporters and sort of encouraging sort of good behavior. Uh, but I don't think that behavior is in particular you know, particularly in vogue right now among uh, elites on, in either party. Okay, well, thank you very much, Dr. Thank you. Okay, for
everyone, if you can, please fill out your evaluation forms and uh, remember, if you could, tell us how you heard about it. And thanks so much for coming.